No, skepticism is awesome. It's, like a, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. So it's Saturday. You guys are not at the parade, obviously. Or you yes. are you will go. Yes. Yet. But you're not gonna get, get like a good place to, to like stand, I guess. That's what husbands are for. Oh <laughs> You know this at least, you know. Um so this morning we got Joe Nickel and Massimo Pelu Piglucci. Right? <laughs> Close. Piglucci. I have a vowel name of my last name too, but you know. The G is silent, right? That's right. As in yeah. Modigliani. That's right. Yeah. Yes, I'm, you know, yes. pretty much Italian. But I should well, know these things, but you know, I was, you know, we'll forgive I'm, you. I'm, I'm Americanized. So uh, we'll start with Joe, the man oh. who I was just saying we had to figure out what to put in his lower third area of the, the video feed, and I, and he said, "Well, look, you put all of my professions." I said, "No, think." Twitter, not the Bible, and that's pretty much true about Joe. So I will let Joe rattle off at least you know a handful of the things you've done in your life. <laughs> oh, good grief! Um, well, I I uh, I did decide uh, somewhere along the line that I wanted to see how many personas I could acquire in my life. I was influenced by George Plimpton, the participatory journalist, and Ferdinand Waldo de Mara known as the great imposter and I wanted to be as honest as Plimpton and as full-time and real as Damara and so I set out I'd done a lot of things as a kid I became a professional stage magician carnival pitchman uh, detective for the world's oldest and largest private detective agency I was a blackjack dealer at Diamond Tooth Gertie's Casino in Dawson City Yukon I was a riverboat manager oh and um, I'm a paranormal investigator. A little bit. Uh, at one time, I was a federal fugitive. I was wanted by the FBI for eight and a half years. I'm particularly proud of that one. What did you do? Yeah, for what? I yeah, was, what did you do? Uh, that What'd was you the do? 60s, and uh, I was opposed to the Vietnam War. Oh, okay. uh, I was tear gassed at the Pentagon, and but eventually my uh, deferments ran out, and I uh, made my way to Canada and lived there for eight and a half years until I was pardoned by President Carter. So, so the federal government no longer considers you armed and dangerous? That's right. In fact, in fact, uh, there, there's some irony. He's still like, dangerous. He's still dangerous. <laughs> still dangerous. <laughs> I've never oh, oh one, of, one of those personas is Barroom Brawler. And I was, I was uh, took that one very, Fight Club? very, very serious. You, you, you were in Fight Club. I was, I uh, broke my fist uh, beating a right. guy's head against the bar So if it's once. Fight Club, we're going to have to ask but, the question. Uh, if you're going to fight one famous person, who would it be? Oh. oh, you mean other than John Edward? <laughs> um, well, you got that. <clears throat> but uh, I did, um, there is an irony about being wanted. I, I uh, Because of my work on the John Demianio Nazi war criminal case, you know about Demianio? Um, I, I was given a VIP tour of the United States Secret Service Document Laboratory, so how dangerous could I be? Yeah, of course, right. they were watching me pretty carefully, so you never know. Is that where you were able to, you know, figure out how to like mint your own wooden nickels? Uh, actually, it's I, I shouldn't tell you this. I don't whittle those. Uh, they're made for me by a wooden nickel company. Oh, okay. Oh wow. Well. Oh well. So we'll go to Massimo. Oh, my so, life is much less interesting. Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> make uh, something up. I, okay, I'll make something up. All right. So I let's, just, uh, let's make it up. I, I've always actually spent being in academia, um, one way or another. Uh, so I grew up in Italy. I did my undergraduate and master's degrees there. And, and um, then I moved to the United States. I did a PhD in, in evolutionary biology at the University of Connecticut. Because I wanted to work on gene-environment interactions. I thought that was the most interesting thing to do in organismal biology, and um, I was right. And it worked out very well. Um, we had a great collaboration with my advisor, who published a shitload of papers uh, and a book. Uh, then I, you know, started the regular academic career. I did a postdoc at Brown University. I uh, was an assistant, associate, and full professor at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And then. Um, 
as I mentioned yesterday, for those of you who were here, um, something happened um, on the way to Damascus. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, the forum? Um, yeah, well. And uh, so what happened was that, you know, after you get tenure and all that, you're supposed to retool yourself and, you know, look, to, look for different things to do. Uh, typically, what for an evolutionary biologist or an ecologist, what that means is that you learn um, molecular biology, which is where the big money is in biology. Uh, but I had already done that when I was in Italy, and it frankly bored me stiff. So I certainly wasn't going to go and do that again. That that same year, just by chance, the University of Tennessee hired a brilliant young philosopher of science, Jonathan Kaplan who, again, just by chance, happened to have done his thesis at Stanford on nature-nurture, which is what philosophers call gene-environment interactions. And so he actually had, you know, I read my, my work, he looked me up on campus, we became friends, we started drinking together, one thing led to another. That's when all the bad things happened. Exactly. One thing led to another. Uh, a couple of years later, I enrolled in the PhD program in philosophy at the University of Tennessee with Jonathan as advisor, which was pretty funny because I was a full professor, he was an assistant, untenured professor at the time. Um, so I kind of was. You were busy. Of, yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I was running the lab in the morning, uh, taking courses in the afternoon, and writing my thesis during the weekend. Wow. Basically, I had no life for three years. So you were born in Liberia, right? I was born in Liberia because my father was uh, working for a um, supervising road construction for a British company in various countries in Africa for about ten years, and in the end, he ended up in Liberia. That's where my mother joined him, and you know they did the kind of thing that leads that, to. That, you know, that, you. That, right. But they left immediately, <laughs> the three months later, because apparently the story goes, I, I really don't remember this. I was a little too, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, but apparently what happened was that the, the boy next to me in the, in the hospital, in the, the hospital, in the field hospital, whatever it is, was attacked by a bull constrictor and, and, and just saved at the last minute by her mo his mother pulling him out of the the boas. This wasn't like one of the sci-fi movies, was it? No, it, it apparently it was real, and so and uh, since I wasn't Hercules who you know wrestled <laughs> the thing and all that, so my mother figured this is not a good way to raise a kid. So they went back to Rome, and right. I grew up in Rome. Yeah, so that's hence your accent. Hence my accent. Yes. So you spent most of your life in Rome, mainly. Uh, 20, yeah, most of it. Uh, I did some after graduation work before moving to the United States in Ferrara, which is a lovely little city uh, in northeastern Italy. Yeah. And then I moved to the United States, yeah. Very cool. So, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> You're looking at me. Well, I, uh, if we were going to mention PhDs, I got one of those. But All right. Yeah, but I was, I was hoping no one there. would notice. <laughs> No, how that how that come about? Was one of your was that one of your you know one of the well, do everything? <clears throat> actually, actually, uh, when I was pardoned by President Carter, I came back to the U.S. and I I really had to come to terms with America again. I was uh, extremely bitter, um, and I uh, traveled around, drifted around. I uh, attended Paul Stater's Hollywood Stunt School, the dumbest thing I probably <laughs> ever did. Uh, I was not killed, as you can see, um, <laughs> but. Um, and then finally, my, my, by that time, my resume, as you can imagine, was looking like a joke. <laughs> and so I decided to reinvent myself. So I went back to school, got a master's and doctorate in English literature with an emphasis on literary investigation and folklore. And taught for several years, taught technical writing, was an adjunct to the engineering department and uh, started publishing and by then I had been doing on the side huge amounts of paranormal stuff since really started in 69 and uh, 95 Skeptical Inquirer offered me a full-time position so I became I think the world's only full-time professional paranormal investigator. Is that that recent? 95? 95 as a full-time. Wow. Yeah but I did it for you know yeah, you did it for that. years I, I had books on the Shroud of Turin and so right. forth but I was I was just, you know, and I would go on, they would call me up and could I go do Oprah and I would... Right. Yeah, because I, would I, I remember growing up reading your stuff, so that must have been before 95. Oh, I'm feeling very old. <laughs> <laughs> very old. <laughs> That's my maybe, wife. You, maybe you read one of my children's books. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> my wife always says, you know, one of the worst things you should do when you meet somebody, especially like you're one of the big stars any, in any time, you should never say, I grew up watching you. She's like, wouldn't that make somebody feel really old? <laughs> yeah, 
But that has already happened to me. I mean, people have already said, oh, I read your stuff when I was in college. Oh, <laughs> so, oh. You know, this happened to me recently. I, right before Dragon Con, I, we got a feedback for Skepticality from a guy who's like, I wanted to thank you, and he sent donated money to us. He said, I finally have, you know, wanted to finally, you know, give you something because I've been listening to you for so long, <coughs> and and I now finally have my PhD, and it's your fault because I went back to school to get it. I was like, wow, it makes me feel old. <laughs> yeah, like, but that's pretty good. It's cool, yeah. but yet, wow, really? So we got a, we created a PhD. <laughs> But yeah, it's a, it's a weird feeling. It's like, well, what, what happened there? Speaking of what happened, I, I think I, I should say um, something about, you know, ni the 95 thing reminded me of how I got into skepticism. Because if you actually check the record, I never written anything about skepticism until 1997. And what happened was that in 1996, I moved to Tennessee. Okay. Well, that and, will do it. Right. As it turned out, that did they're, do they're, it. They're right over there. You want to go see them? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so what happened was that, that in... Um, so I get there at the University of Tennessee as a freshly appointed you know, assistant professor of evolutionary biology, right? So first of all, the first, the first story that I hear is that the department had just changed its name from zoology to evolutionary biology, and that one of the trustees of the university had called immediately the president saying, what's, it, what's this thing with, with you guys now having an evolutionary biology department? And the president, who didn't know that this had happened, answered, not in my, on my campus. <laughs> so I said, oh, that's an odd oh, thing. You know, science. Who needs yeah. It? And, uh, and then what happened was, you know, I opened the newspaper and uh, the Tennessee legislature, in its infinite lack of wisdom, um, <laughs> Uh, start, you know, trying to pass. We lost. They cut off your microphone. Yeah. You know, I, know, I know it's not that interesting, but still. Mentioned evolution. And they just <laughs> yeah, that's it. right. Wait, intelligent design? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Here we are in Georgia. And so we, we <laughs> opened this thing, off. and there was, uh, you know, the, the Tennessee legislature tried to pass an anti evolution, unequal teaching of creation and evolution. I, I looked at it and said, I, what? And then it dawned on me that, holy crap, I'm in the middle of the Bible Belt, and, and, and I'm only 50 miles from the side of the Scopes trial. And and all that sort yeah. of stuff, right? That up to that point, and I see for me was Jack Daniels. There wasn't, you know, there was no other association. And so, you know, the the, the crisis passed. The BBC actually came on campus, and they did, and went to Nashville, and they did a whole documentary about this whole thing. It, the, it turns out the bill didn't even get out of committee, fortunately. But then, after the crisis passed, I remember sitting in a you know brewery in downtown Knoxville with a couple of colleagues and three or four graduate students, and and I said, you know, we should really do something proactive about this thing instead of. Um, it again. It's the cable on the end of the mic. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So this one worked. Yeah. Okay. And um, and that's how we got Darwin Day started. Okay. One of the first Darwin Days was in, in Knoxville in 2007. It was, uh, our guest was uh, Doug Futuima of Stony Brook University, which is where I went to work then, 10 years later. Uh, but that's how I got started into this thing. And I have to say, um, it has huge, hugely enriched my life. It's, it's been one of the things that I now devote a lot of my time. Uh, I feel lucky after having been able to switch to philosophy because I now I can literally pick whatever the hell I want to work on and I don't have to do experiments on it, nor do I have to write grand proposals. And so now my specialty is becoming, you know, I started out with philosophy of science. But my specialty is becoming the philosophy of pseudoscience. Now, how cool is that? I get to do professionally what I actually do as outreach and for fun. Well, that's what they life always, is good, man. They, parents always <laughs> kill their kids. That's what they, that's what you should do, right? That's not what my father said. He oh. said that I was gonna. Have, I was Be a brick later. No, I I, I should have used my brain to make money in the private sector. Well, it sounds like Italian. Yeah. So oh, wow. with one of those. <laughs> well, the uh, the secret to life, I think, uh, is that you you find something you like to do, and you do have to be reasonably good at it. But then you get someone to pay you to do it. Now. And that's the lucky part. That's not easy. Yeah, that's that's what I did. I I began increasingly to want to parlay my private detective background and my background as a magician to being a sort of magic detective and and trying to solve solve uh, strange mysteries and uh, made it a hobby and you know published published books and got on TV and so forth and what what was your most difficult case well uh, the one that's uh, difficult in so many ways was the shroud of turin not right. not because the shroud is 
maybe that incredibly uh, complex, but for one thing, you had this fanatical uh, group of people promoting it and putting out all sorts of just false information of all sorts, while trying pretty strictly to keep skeptics from getting anywhere near it. And uh, it's very difficult to work with Because your, they burn it? Or what, what, um, why <laughs> <laughs> it's, very, it's very difficult to work with your hands tied behind your back yeah. while blindfolded, but I, yeah. but I managed. Uh, they did uh, eventually put um, uh, put together a team. That all almost all the team was uh, members of the Holy Shroud Guild, which was rather like having the Flat Earth Society. I, say the, I never heard about the Holy Shroud Guild. Yeah, investigate the curvature of the Earth, but um, <laughs> they uh, they did put on a world famous microanalyst, Walter McCrone, and uh, he found tempera paint all over the shroud, for which they they then. Um, you know, held him to a secrecy agreement while putting out a false report that they had found no evidence of any fakery. And he had to wait uh, until his covenant not to disclose expired. And um, so it was difficulties like that to work, to work around to get accurate information and so forth. But, um, and then it was just, uh, you know, one was just impossibly badly treated. So uh, that that may be one of the most difficult cases, because, and, and and of course it's it's been an albatross around my neck ever since. I can't uh, get away from it. I was going to ask constant, you. constantly. Oh, we just discovered yeah, gonna, something on the shroud, and these discoveries are made around Easter time. Yeah. <laughs> and I was going to ask. And there's you. never anything to them. They peter out mm -hmm. as soon as as soon as skeptics spend hour upon hour upon hour to again laboriously try to get the facts and figure out how they could ever claim something that incredible. And then it's, you know, is this sort of, oh, well, never mind. We've just, is it Easter again? Okay, we just found this now. Let's forget that. We just now have found, you know, they would, they would find pollens on it that proved it had been in Palestine. Well, no such thing. That was, that was a scientific fraud. But, uh, I mean, it's just, in, just incredible. Yeah, so to ask, is that happened, actually, it wasn't around Easter, but it was recently, I think it was last year, like middle of the year at some point, that, Somebody found that, well, the the fabric couldn't have been made any later than this. Like, how did that how does that even work? I, I assume that you probably got that call too. Oh, it, it, it's just it's it's endless, and um, you know. But it's one of the rewards of doing this sort of thing is that uh, others have joined a bit. Uh, my Italian friend um, Luigi Garlaschelli. Um, took two ideas from my my book Inquest on the Shroud of Turin. One I used a because the the, the image on the shroud is a quasi negative. Uh, the pro shroud people tell you it's a perfect photographic negative, which is just simply not true. But it, it does have quasi negative darks and lights reversed um, properties. And I showed early on that. There is an artistic technique that exactly has just the quasi-negative properties, just the positive and negative blend, and so forth. It's called a, a rubbing, and uh, I developed. It's, it's a, a technical more, term. It's 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 a well, it's it's a more complicated in, in application. It's a wet mold type of rubbing, but but um, so I, he took that idea from me, and then I had suggested because if you took off all the pigment particles. There still is a odd yellow stain that's not been uh, definitively explained. It could be residue from paint. It could be a burst from the burst of miraculous radiation at the moment of Christ's resurrection, uh, or some other property. I suggested um, uh, still another, um, uh, which I think is the best suggestion, is that the pigment was acidic and it simply degraded the cellulose. But and I did a lot of work on that. But anyway. Uh, uh, Gigi took two of those ideas and made a complete replica of the shroud, full size, whole bit, artificially aged it, washed it, voila, yellow stain, everything. It's really a wonderful accomplishment. And I was at a science fair in Genoa where he presented that, and he acknowledged me and said I was the brain, he was only the hands, which was too generous, but better, better too generous than 
too nasty. I did. I want to just make sure that you know everybody here knows what the Chow Turin really was, right? Maybe need the refresher on what that was. All right, These good. guys are experts. I just want to make sure it's the it's the burial cloth of Jesus. <laughs> not allegedly. Not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe eventually, eventually we're going to take some questions, you think? Sure, why not? You, does anybody have any questions? Get on the microphone and we can... <laughs> we're just uh, rambling on. Yeah, it's a yeah. chat. So oh, there's a, oh, there are people out there. I'm sorry. Uh, there are people out there. <laughs> yes. Who knew? It's not just the three of us. Who knew? I just thought we were... Now, uh, Massimo, you were involved with the, uh, the whole intelligence design mess about five or six years ago, right? Yeah. Um, I, I was not um, indirectly involved in, in any of the trials. Yeah. Okay. So the you know the the Dover thing. Most of my colleagues, including Eugenie Scott, who is yeah. here actually, well, she was um, pretty, she was pretty big that. in that. Um, yeah, I wrote a lot about it. I published a book a few years ago called Denying Evolution, which is about both creationism in in general and so intelligent design in, in in particular. Yeah, I've I've been collaborating with the National Center for Science Education. Uh, I've debated several times. Bill Demsky, Michael Behe. My, my my best experience was with Michael Behe. This was a few years ago at um, NYU. Uh, so this was after the Dover trial. And uh, the, the debate was interesting because it actually was not supposed to be a debate about intelligent design versus evolution. It was supposed to be, this was hosted by the journalism school at uh, New York University. And so the, the audience was made mostly of journalist students. And uh, the idea was to debate how should the media cover controversies uh, such as intelligent design. So there was, uh, I was there, Michael Behe was there, and uh, I forgot her name, but it was uh, at the time the religious uh, religion reporter for the New York Times, who had actually covered the Dover style. And so, but it, inevitably, we got into a discussion with Michael about intelligent design, even well, though that was really, there, yeah, you know, sure. it's just, yeah, you have to do it. And so I was, I, I was ready for the entire evening with my sort of trump card. Uh, just, just waiting for the moment that I was getting to maximum annoyance. With <laughs> you, were, you were, you were annoying, or you? No, were I was anno I was getting increasingly annoyed. I okay, knew that was going to get. Okay. Yeah. You were like, you know, making him annoyed. I should take that back. I probably was annoying as well, <laughs> but, but I wouldn't know. I, I did know that um, that I was getting. I, I knew I was going to get increasingly annoyed, and so I, I kept my trump card. Uh, up until that moment, so when he, when he really said something outrageously stupid, um, I quoted, I put a slide, and I quoted from the Delvers trial transcripts. Uh, you, pro you guys probably know, but at some point, um, Michael Understand was asked uh, the following question, I'm paraphrasing, you know, if your definition of, of intelligent design as science is correct, wouldn't it follow that astrology is also a science? <laughs> And to his credit, he honestly answered, yes, it would. Well, well, there you go. And so I put it that up, and the audience, which was already skeptical enough, I mean, you know, there's yeah. a bunch of journalists in, in, the, in the making, so they're already skeptical enough, they just laughed. And I, I, I honestly felt bad for the guy, just for a tiny fraction of a second. <laughs> That, 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 you know, you're, 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 you stick with that. Yeah. yeah, and it was great because that that is that's the kind of thing actually that works. Um, I've uh, you know I've done a lot of debates, and it turns out that the things that work have nothing to do with your arguments, or very little to do with your arguments. Yeah. Uh, they have to do with the with what you present, when, and how. So when I was presenting, for instance, when I was debating, uh, what's his name, Jonathan Wells, uh, Discovery Institute, another intelligent design <laughs> proponent. Uh, it was great. It was a full auditorium in, uh, on the campus of the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. There must have been a thousand people. I mean, it was just really impressive. And most of, I knew most of them were on his side. You know, there were some, my graduate students were there and a couple of my colleagues, but mostly it was on his side. And so we have this thing back and forth, and, uh, and Jonathan was making a big deal out of the fact that, you know, I took evolution seriously. I even went back to graduate school and got a degree, a PhD in biology, as it turns out, in biochemistry, not in evolutionary biology. But uh, precisely because I wanted to learn blah, blah, blah. And I knew he was lying. And the reason I knew he was lying, because on his website, it says that he did that at the um, suggestion of the Reverend Moon, because he's a, he's a Mooney. And um, wow. yeah, and he says that on the website. So I was waiting for the moment where he would say something like that and show a slide from his website 
right? My intention was to show the, to, to, the, to the audience that he was actually lying to them. Yeah. It worked, but not for that reason. It worked when they, found, when they heard the word Mooney. <laughs> well. That's what mm. upset the people. It, they didn't care they was lying to them. What was upsetting was that it was not a Southern Baptist. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> okay, whatever. Score. <laughs> I thought I scored a goal that way. It turned out I did it that. Well, that's fine. Have you been to the uh, Creation Museum in Northern Kentucky? No, I've, I've, I already left the area and I haven't been back since. Well, I recommend anybody that gets a chance to go, I recommend that you go because it is an astonishing place. It's, Do they give a discount to the skeptics? No. Uh, it's best not to tell them you are a skeptic. Um, <laughs> uh, wear a bulletproof vest in case they find out. No, I, it, it's but it's an incredible place because it's it's very uh, professionally done at the level of you know creating a large uh, museum with with sophisticated displays, um, dinosaurs that you Have know look very uh, animated and very very expensively done dinosaurs right there with with Adam and Eve. Well, they had some of the and, dinosaurs uh, have saddles. This is yeah, dinosaurs these, have saddles. These people take the Flintstones as a documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's bizarre. So it's it's uh, but it's it's just an incredible place and uh, worth worth going to. It's too bad you have to actually pay admission. Maybe you could I don't know, sneak in or something. I think it's a version. And I think it's in a dry county. In oh. Probably that wouldn't surprise me. Of course, the, no. the, the Jack Daniels Distillery is in a dry. Yeah, county, no, it's which bizarre. is kind of like what? <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. Well, most people in the South know this, but I think it's weird. It's like okay, they make. The most popular whiskey in the world. Yeah. But yeah. I, I went to the distillery. I did this, the, the the tour, and then at the end they bring in this huge mahogany bar lined up with bottles of whiskey, and they give you lemonade. And I said, "What?" Yeah. yeah. I said, "Well, you have to drive out of the county to buy the whiskey." They're just Fine. No. Jack Jack Daniels, by the way, is Tennessee whiskey. I'll yeah. just say that as a Kentuckian. Yes, it is Tennessee whiskey. Uh, absolutely. Kentucky makes bourbon, mm -hmm. and uh, and I understand that there is no difference. Uh, really, really. There is a difference, and um, uh, one of my books is called uh, The Kentucky Mint Julep, Ooh. and it's by Colonel Joe Nickel. I am a Kentucky colonel. <laughs> Did you get that from the KFC school of... Well, <laughs> well uh, people don't understand uh, the, the, uh, the colonel thing. Uh, colonel Sanders of KFC was a Kentucky colonel. He was a real Kentucky colonel, just as I am a real Kentucky colonel. He just went off in fried chicken and I went off into haunted houses uh, but uh, <laughs> how do you become a Kentucky I, I, colonel? You, you become a Kentucky colonel um, let me make an analogy it's not so grandiose but the Queen of England can make you you know can knight you right the governor of Kentucky can make you a colonel ah. um, it sounds a little more prestigious than it is, but I <laughs> but but I say that the the rumor that they pass these out on street corners around election time is not true. It's not true. You tried that, didn't you? <clears throat> I'll I'll try that. <laughs> so how do but you get I I became a Kentucky Colonel. I have a certificate, and um, it always seemed to me rather rather silly until we. You know, I got older, and I got old enough to sort of be called Colonel. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, you had to have white hair to like you know, match the yeah, the yeah. Time. So we were doing this Both book, are cool, uh, the Kentucky Mint Julep, and um, publisher said, "How about by Colonel Tom Nicole?" And I, I thought, "Yeah, let's let's do that." It was fun. So how do you become the Colonel? How did you come become a colonel? You went oh, to the street corner during well, the election. Uh, well, oh, you mean other than other than the governor uh, bestowing it upon me? Uh, Why actually, did the governor bestow it? Then? Actually, I was uh, it's kind of ironic. I was a I was simply a teenager who had uh, at that time I was known in my hometown. I was an artist long before I ever thought of writing. So and I had done a keeping um, score is another <clears throat> thing he's done. I had done a watercolor portrait of President Kennedy, and my father, who was postmaster, had it over his desk. And the Secretary of State of Kentucky was from our hometown, a man named Henry Carter, old, old Southern family friend. And Henry was back home politicking, as they would say. <laughs> and he stopped in and admired the portrait. And my father said proudly, my son painted that. And that's all we knew about it. Um, the next thing we knew, 
a handsome uh, signed certificate came from the from uh, Frankfurt, from the capital. Uh, Henry had obviously, <laughs> you know, written down a few names and wow. filled out the forms or something and took them in. And I think I think the governor was out or something, and the lieutenant governor was acting governor for some reason or whatever. And he just he just signed them all for him and. And that was it. So I, I was the Kentucky Colonel. Well, at least you did something for at, it. At an unlikely, uh, unlikely age of I don't know, fifteen or something. Wow. And so you're from. Women are colonels, uh, in, in, you know, in, which is good. Which is good. And um, anyway, enough about that. So you're from Kentucky. I I am. I'm uh, was raised in the hills, the Appalachian foothills. The Holler? Eastern Kentucky. Pardon? The Holler? Um, uh, in a small valley town. And uh, as you can see, I did get get shoes and, uh, and an education. <laughs> <laughs> a somewhat difficult uh, to get an education. I remember once as a boy, um, probably eighth grade. So, yeah, eighth grade, I think. I had found some fossils back on one of the ridges, the brachiopods, and I had excavated a slab of these fossils and brought them into science class. Whereupon the science teacher said, well, you see, boys and girls, this proves the story of Noah's Ark. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, and even you know, I was I knew enough to know that that was silly. But but um, <laughs> and how old were you? I was in the eighth grade. Yeah, so. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I knew that was I knew that was silly. But you know, he's a very beloved teacher, and um, I, all around me were things like that. And you'd learn to just kind of go with the flow at some point. <clears throat> I've always Kentucky, found that. You know, Kentucky education reminds me of this thing. When I was in Tennessee, um, th there is always competition. This was always competition when I was in Tennessee for how to move away from the bottom of the rankings in you know education, healthcare, and all that sort of stuff, right? And so at one point we got upset. My my colleague and I when it became upset because the, uh, Kentucky passed us, and so we became number. <laughs> We became number 49. And so from that point on, for a couple of years, I heard, thank God for Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's still true. but Indeed. Uh, Jeannie Scott, by the way, and I both were at the University of Kentucky at the same time. No, oh, I didn't know that one. Yeah. Know that was, other? pardon? Did you all know each other at the time? Uh, slightly, I think. I knew, I knew of her anyway. I, I, I think we had met. But um, you didn't date or anything? No, no, no. Those rumors, well, are just rumors. You know what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> just start some rumors. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I think you just did. <laughs> you, you did. <laughs> speaking of speaking of rumors, since we're just chatting along and I'm being silly, but uh, when I came back to Kentucky after after my exile in Canada, and I came back to my little hometown and. There were people who would turn away from me and uh, not speak to me, and there were others who would run up and hug me in the street. It was it was typical of the divisiveness of that Vietnam War era, post Vietnam War era. But when one, uh, one woman said to me, um, she came up and said, "Do you know that when your grandfather died, uh, we here, we well, she said, you you know the town was crawling with FBI agents, and she said we hear you." slipped back in disguise and were at the funeral in disguise. Well, the and I said, no, no, that's not true. She said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and I thought, you know, why am I debunking this? That's a wonderful legend. I, yes. you know, let, yeah, why would you do that? <laughs> but, in, but in fact, FBI, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in fact, uh, the FBI was there. We knew it. Uh, and uh, my father called me and said, you know, um, the FBI is here and you mustn't come back. And I said, no, I, I wouldn't be doing that because I'd put everybody else in jeopardy. And we knew that because the sheriff, the yeah, then sheriff of Morgan County, and I kept this a secret until long after he died, but he, uh, he violated the law uh, on the basis of 
uh, family, and he told my father. Hmm. And I don't know what he thought about, whether he thought I was right or wrong, but I know he, he didn't think I was a bad person. He may, have dis he may or may not have disagreed with me, I don't know. But as a kid, you know, artist, I'd, I had once painted his sheriff's car, I think. I was sort of the local sign painter. and There you go. He, he now painted I'm, his car like on like canvas or painted his car? A lettered, you know, a sheriff. Ah. Lettering, lettering, sign painter. I was, I was um, forced to be a sign painter. I was, I was the local artist. People needed Keeping signs. Track, right? They, uh, they will sort of a small town will sort of make you do things. You know, I had an aunt who needed a beauty shop sign, and uh, the Kiwanis Club needed a big banner across the street for a horse show and so forth. And I started something, just sort of forced into it, and then enterprising, thinking I could make money doing this. So I, I studied and learned that was one of my first serious trades was as a sign painter and painted, you know, the sides of the building for Coca-Cola and Monroe shock absorbers, <laughs> painted uh, letters four feet high across the bowling lanes, uh, um, worked off of extension ladders, uh, did gold leaf, sold electric signs, uh, had a complete shop. Uh, started when I was 14 and did that every summer through college. I told you my life is much less interesting. You, you, guys, <laughs> you guys should really get some coffee and, and start asking questions. <laughs> You're asleep. <laughs> um, uh, within skepticism, you, you, you mean? Sure. Um, uh, <laughs> I will. I will repeat. Well, I will repeat different stories. I, I will. I will repeat the question. Sure. She she didn't want to get up on the mic. That she asked Massimo what her biggest challenge has been. Um, that is a good question, and probably the, my biggest challenge was Ginny Scott. Um, oh, so you so you dated her too? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we can start that rumor as well. <laughs> Um, now, my biggest challenge was Ginny, and, and uh, I think it's an interesting story actually because it taught me quite a bit, both about Ginny and about the skeptical movement. So this was right at the beginning when I, I just started getting interested in, in doing outreach things in, in Knoxville. It's the second year that we ran the Darwin Day, uh, I invited Ginny as well as Will, Will Provine, who is an historian at Cornell University. And they're, they're very good friends, although they completely disagree on, on a bunch of things, including how to deal with atheism and the relationship between uh, atheism and science and that sort of stuff, which I knew, and, and that's why I invited both of them. Um, at any rate, it turns out that Ginny had just gone, uh, right before coming to Knoxville, he had just gone in the National Association of Biology Teachers to change their official definition of evolution in a move that I saw as a sellout. Um, and uh, I did not understand at the time that what she was trying to do was to play on the difference between methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. I'm sure you guys know, but let me just yeah, briefly summarize wanna, the thing, wanna, right? They, had, they don't have the coffee yet. Yeah, so exactly. Them so a philosophical naturalist is somebody who, has, who is convinced that naturalism, you know, materialism is all there is out there on the grounds, uh, on philosophical grounds. So if you're an atheist, you're a philosophical naturalist, okay? Uh, a lot of philosophers are philosophical naturalists for reasons that are, you know, have to do with Occam razor, with, with not finding any convincing argument, not to be a naturalist, and so on and so forth. Methodological naturalism, on the other hand, it's a more limited position that basically says, look, I don't know whether there is a supernatural or not, but if I do science, I cannot invoke it. So a scientist, all he, all he needs to, to be is a methodological naturalist. He may be a philosophical naturalist, but he only needs to be a methodological naturalist. Mm. Um, right? So you can't write a science paper and say, and by the way, God, another explanation may be God did it. That's not, uh, not allowed, but it's not that it's not allowed because you necessarily don't believe in God. It's not allowed because it doesn't add anything to the science. Okay? Now, at the time, I did not have that, I, that, that distinction clear in my mind. I did not understand that distinction. Uh, Gini used that distinction, which is well understood in philosophy, um, as essentially a political tool. And said, look, all the, the, the biology teachers need to do is to explain to their kids that uh, science doesn't force you to be an atheist. What it does force you to do is not invoke miracles when you're looking, when you're doing science, which was a very reasonable position. Mm -hmm. I got so damn upset about it that I actually started a <laughs> 
petition um, against this thing to convince the NIBT to reverse itself and got actually you know, more than a thousand signatures from scientists largely who like me, did not understand the difference between <laughs> the two positions. Um, now, Jeannie came in, so she landed in Knoxville just the day after I had published the petition. So she looked at me. Okay. <laughs> and, th and this is where the relationship started? Yes. During we never the, met. the music right. came never up. Met. Yeah. That's right. okay. So, like, and she looked at me like, you bad boy. Um, you bad boy. <laughs> Whoa. And, um, <laughs> She was very gracious about it because she is that kind of person. She's a very yeah. gracious person. And um, fine. So we did a nice uh, Darwin Day event. She had her debate with, with uh, Will Provine about atheism. She, she did a workshop for our teachers. Everything went fine. But a year and a half, a couple of years later, I actually started getting more and more interested in the philosophy and eventually got into the PhD program. And so I finally read about this damn thing. I read a landmark paper by Barbara Forrest who has been, he's a, she's a philosopher at um, uh, Louisiana State University, and um, uh, she actually has been at the Dover trial. She was one of the, the uh, witnesses on the, at the Dover trial. And that paper is on the difference between methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. I read the paper and I said, holy shit, Ginny was absolutely right. <laughs> um, so I wrote her an email. I said, Ginny, I apologize. You're, I was wrong, you're right. She went back immediately and she said, I just fell off the chair. <laughs> <laughs> And we've been best friends since. We never, every time we see each other, you know, she comes to New York and uh, uh, fairly often, and, and we see each other at conferences, and it's a, it's a great story. But she was absolutely right. Um, by the way, that also implies that Richard Dawkins is wrong, because he does not make that distinction. Mm -hmm. He violates that distinction. He does not get it. Richard Dawkins is at the same stage of intellectual development I was at the time. <laughs> Massimo was... Uh, <laughs> right, right, right did, did, I get, did I get in trouble now? No, no, you can write him a letter and maybe later on you'll have... We actually met at Tam last year. And yeah. I told him. And what when did he say? He, he, he said that he doesn't understand philosophers. And I said, well, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so the music hasn't come But up. it wasn't official. We were, you know, it, I actually have a picture to show that this actually happened. But it wasn't on stage, so we don't have a record of it. Other than the pictures. I, yes, we do have the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Massimo the picture has no uh, captions. <laughs> Massimo was quoting Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln famously, I think to one of the generals uh, during the Civil War, wrote a, a, a famous short message that said, you were, you were right and I was wrong. Yeah. It was a model of brevity. Yeah, yeah. it happens. And yeah. it's, it's actually a liberating feeling, you know, yeah. once in a while to say, well, okay, it's like an a, It's like an AA moment? moment. I don't know, no, I've never been in AA, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> he should have been. I uh, should have but, been, but, you know. Never was. I like my martinis too much. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? There, see, I knew, I, I saw somebody getting See, answers. now we're getting started because you, you got only 17 minutes, but we got Yeah, started. and I, I showed up late, I apologize. That's all right. on time. I'm you have your, uh, your tardy excuse um, ready? Okay. Hey, no. <laughs> so it's all right. Do you have your note? Uh, no. Uh, no, nothing. But you have a question. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, since I missed most of the discussion, I wonder if I can ask a civil or ethical question. That's what we're doing. Uh, just questions, period? Yeah. I, I, really, yep. I really meant to be here. Um, so, now I have to really think. <laughs> I, had, I, uh, I, I used to be LDS, and I went to Brigham Young University for a while. And, I'm, and this is an honest question. I'm not going either way. I, I want to know what you two think. Um, they allow for non-LDS people to go to Brigham Young, about one in 50, roughly. Um, and they do allow atheists to go, but if you leave the LDS church and you're at Brigham Young, their policy is to kick you out. And I'm wondering if you think, in this country, being a private school, if that's ethical or if that's right to, to do, if that's their right to do in this country, in the same sense that other groups could, could kind of choose who they want to go to their school or to their organization. Well, you made the distinction right there between being um, allowed permissible and being ethical. I suspect it's legally permissible. I think it's unethical. Uh, but there is a distinction, of course, between ethics and, and the law. Uh, the, the two should be related um, <laughs> to some extent. Although, although, of course, you don't want them to be one. A lot of people think that the law should reflect uh, ethics, yeah, period. Yeah. But that's clearly not the case. There are things that are illegal and they're not unethical, like you know, jaywalking. For instance, it's, or, there's uh, nothing immoral about jaywalking, but it is illegal, or not wearing a or refusing or to uh, fight in the in the Vietnam War. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so the two are not one and the same. But in that case, 
Um, yeah, it seems like a bad reflection on the school to do that sort of thing. Uh, there are these, those similar cases have been challenged. I mean, uh, you know, uh, fundamentalist colleges like uh, the one run by uh, what's his name, uh, Liberty University, yeah. for instance, Jerry Falwell. Jerry Falwell um, uh, they got into trouble for doing things of that sort. I mean, you, you cannot discriminate. You cannot impose. There are certain number of policies that that it's that are hard to defend. Um, uh, legally, for instance, at uh, Liberty University, you cannot have interracial dating, and that's like, like what really? Um, that was challenging in, in legally, and I think they lost. Yeah. Liberty University lost. No, that's right, Bob Jones. That's right. You're right. That's right. You're correct. Oh, picky, picky. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's, that's Liberty, Bob Jones. But Liberty does have similar policies. I mean, if it's not that one, it's got. There's a really interesting book about Liberty itself, actually. That um, it's written by a journalist student at Brown at the time. Um, I forgot the title, and I don't remember the name of the author. That's helpful, isn't it? <laughs> um, but it came out a couple of years ago, and, uh, and it was about, he spent a semester uh, undercover, basically, at Liberty University, and, and then wrote a, bo a book about it, and it's quite something. Yeah. The Unlikely Disciple. The Unlikely Disciple, that's right. That is, the, that is the book, correct. And nobody made the Star Trek, you know, joke with the LDS. Oh well. I was just being bad. Oh, nice. <laughs> right, um, I kind of have two questions, but uh, when I think of skepticism, I think of uh, just trying to find truth against like false statements and stuff. But uh, I might be reducing it, but um, based on like coming to the panels yesterday and uh, today, uh, it seems that the skeptics are largely like, academics. And I think I was wondering if uh, you think it's important for skeptics to have an academic career, like be it in philosophy or science or some sort of uh, proactive like learning. Or and also, um, do you or do you think skeptics should have like a moral standpoint when coming to skeptical things? Yeah, that's a good question. You want to come well? Uh, uh, let me address the first uh, the first part of that anyway. Uh, um, I. I was a skeptic for years without being an academic. Um, I, I think you should bring to skepticism whatever you can. And I was like James Randi. Uh, James Randi is not an academic, has no no advanced degrees, maybe not even a college degree. I don't know. Sure. But he was uh, he was a remarkably uh, talented uh, person and, a, and a, a stage magician and uh, escape artist and following in the traditions of Houdini. So. Uh, he used his magic background to uh, expose charlatans who were using supposedly psychokinetic powers to pin spoons and and to project uh, thoughts onto photographic film and so forth. And Randy was catching them. Uh, he would have not been assisted one whit in those endeavors by being an academic. In fact, he's fond of saying that you know, yeah, yeah. scientists are, are easily fooled because they live in a world where people tell the truth. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, uh, that's true. Project. So yeah, that's true. Um, I, I too came, um, you know, first as, as a magician. I was resident magician at the Houdini Hall of Fame, which is how I know Randy. And then I was a detective for a famous detective agency whose name I'm not supposed to use for publicity purposes, but um, did it start with a P? Did they go after the Jesse James gang? I can't say. But <laughs> but uh, it, later in life I did, as, as I began to be kind of a professional or semi-professional skeptic, um, I thought, you know, if, if if I learned to write better, learn to do research, because I could see the cases where I needed to do historical research, um, I thought if I went back to school and got a, a degree, uh, it would be helpful and people would take me more seriously. And um, so I, I ended up with a PhD, but I, I don't use that uh, label very much because it does sort of label you as academic. And I, I would much rather be thought of as a kind of you know, uh, ex Kearney pitchman and, and that sort of thing. Blacksmith. Yeah, that sort of thing. And uh, hands on. And, and um, so I, I think you use whatever background you have. It, uh, I, I would much rather see uh, a knowledgeable magician than, a, than an academic who uh, was sitting in his armchair somewhere and had never been in a haunted house. Um, so, but, no, but, but ideally, you do. You'd, the more you do, if you do all of that, 
which is what I've tried to do, then you, you can become even more effective. I try to use very scholarly techniques, uh, but then I try to disguise the, you know, I try to write in a very readable style. And uh, I want to address the second part of the question in a minute, but also make a comment, a follow-up comment on this. First of all, I actually think my experience is that most skeptics are not academics. Uh, there, there is a good number of academics, especially in recent years, really, yeah. who've mm-hmm. got involved mm-hmm. in the skeptic movement. Uh, you know, Richard Dawkins being the, the obvious example. You know, Jerry Coyne and, and, and a few others. Um, but most of the skeptics are not academics, and this, the movement certainly didn't start as an academic movement, and it's largely still not an academic movement. Uh, and I think that's a strength. I think that is important. Uh, I, yesterday, I think I mentioned in the panel discussion that I think one of the important things that the skeptic community can do is to interface between academics who are notoriously bad at talking to the public, you yeah. know, with few exceptions. I mean, Dawkins is good, but there, there's very few exceptions to that rule, and the public itself, which is not very receptive to these kind of things. So I think that the skeptic community can play, plays already, but it can and increasingly play, it plays an important social role uh, because this is essentially a grassroots uh, critical thinking movement, uh, which, f- for crying out loud, this country certainly needs. Um, <laughs> so that's one thing. The, the, the morality, uh, you, you mentioned that, that is about what about ethical position, right? Moral, moral positions. Yes, I think there is a moral stance for a skeptic. Uh, and that was summarized actually by um, Thomas Huxley, you know, uh, Darwin's bulldog. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a slide with the exact quote that I'll present it tomorrow evening's, tomorrow afternoon's uh, talk. But um, the, the actually basically thought that giving up the pretense to, to you know, the, 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 the belief in, in, in things that are illusory is a moral duty. That is, that searching for the truth, as much as you know, you can, or as close as you can get to it, it's a moral thing. That it is immoral to believe things that are that are false. Um, and why did he think that? In part because truth, at least for some people, truth itself has value. Um, this is what philosophers call the, 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 the blue pill, red pill problem after the Matrix. <laughs> right? Uh, so it, it's would been you, around for a long time. Yeah, though. right. It's yeah. been around for way before the Matrix. I mean, in fact, the, the, the Matrix is a great movie. Yeah, yeah, no, it did not. But, but, but philosophers do use the, ma- the Matrix, the movie, to introduce yeah. students to that kind of question, right? The question there is, would you rather uh, uh, have an easy life, which however, it's a bunch of lies, or you know, the real thing, however difficult it may be? And most of us think that it is the moral thing, the ethical thing to do, to pursue the truth for its own sake. But the other thing is, of course, the idea that uh, believing in falsehoods is m- likely to kill people or to make them worse off because you, you don't navigate the world in, in the best way you can. Um, so, so there is a moral component to it, yes. Uh, truth and, and uh, critical thinking and, uh, and rigorous inquiry are ethical values uh, within the skeptical community. I might add one other thing uh, about the ethical part. Um, it's important for me to treat people with respect whenever possible. I, uh, I think there's a maybe a growing trend whenever now. possible. It's an interesting uh, qualification. There's uh, <laughs> well, uh, no, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I, I go after charlatans and fraud artists uh, with the best of them, and I, you know, I'm proud that my name appears in the last chapter of John Edwards' book as, as really? uh, along with uh, John Hockenberry of Dateline NBC for our gotcha moment. I, I'm proud of that because we got you, John. We caught you cheating. Um, but uh, when I see people make fun of someone who's reported a lake monster um, and, and they go, or they go, uh, I find that offensive. Um, I have been in those people's homes. I have talked to them. I've been uh, out, uh, away from the armchair, out in the the far reaches, and I know that it's sane, intelligent, decent uh, people have seen a long-necked, multi-humped, undulating creature, 30 to 40 feet long. I know that they have, in fact, seen something that looks exactly like that. I, I think I know what they've seen, it's an and it is not, yeah, it's three or four otters swimming in a line, uh, but it's very deceptive. And what our challenge is, is to show with respect that those people are probably mistaken. Yeah. And we can do that without, and I, I won't mention uh, specifics, I, I don't like to speak ill of fellow skeptics, but I've seen skeptics make fun of someone uh, who had a 
religious belief or something that uh, was okay maybe it's it's a little silly okay then make fun of the make fun of the silly part of it but you don't have to belittle the person and i for me that's an ethical position and by the way, I, I'd like to, people to know that my chair, where I do my, most of my thinking, does not have arms. Does not have arms. So it's, I, it's I don't, a plier, though, isn't it? Yeah. And let me uh, hasten to add that I do have an armchair. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, some of my writing is actually done in a comfortable armchair, but only after I have gone out right. and caused trouble in the, in the real world. Next. Um, I have uh, two questions, I guess. Um, the first, just out of curiosity, on um, I know Michael Behe, that I'm aware of, has been confronted with the astrology analogy at least twice, and mm-hmm. probably more times than that. Has anyone ever point blank asked him if he thinks that the astrology controversy should be taught as well? Like, <laughs> if that's his actual opinion? Mm-hmm. I, I, that I know of. No. Okay. Um, Now, given that he's on record for that, however, Mm -hmm. it it seems to me that he he simply only has one answer. Yeah. Right? I mean, well, no. Let me me take it back. He has two answers. One is to say, yes, it should be taught, uh, or or to agree that, in fact, intelligent design should not be taught. And it's either way it goes. Yeah. It's, a bad, it's a bad place it's a to be at. Good question, though, for some yeah. different. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other, the other question, which is is related, I guess, is you, you know, you hear stories like that, and like, you know, Jonathan Wells lying about why he went and did science, and um, I imagine this may be a question you've gotten many times before, but it's hard to imagine, given the things that they will acknowledge like that, that they actually believe the things that they're saying, or that they believe all of the things that they're saying. And I was wondering whether you thought that it was, you know, uh, at least maybe those two, like, whether they just think fuzzily about it and can believe it because of that, or whether they Mm -hmm. don't believe it at all and they're purely trying to make money, or... That's an excellent um, question, and um, I've been around these people and Joe has as well um, enough that I can I think I can say that most of these people actually do believe what they're saying um, but that, that does require quite a bit of fuzzy thinking uh, it, this thing came home to me uh, years ago when I, I, was a, I did a debate with Duane Gish of the Institute for Creation Research actually I debated Gish five times and after that, I, it turns out that somebody proposed a sixth debate, and he, then, he said, no, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't know whether he got tired of me or whatever, but um, he refused. In one of the debates, he showed a slide with a quote from Stephen Jay Gould, you know, one of the most prominent evolutionary biologists of the latter part of the 20th century. And if you read the quote, it looked like Gould didn't believe in evolution. I looked at the quote, I said, that can't be right. <laughs> yeah. um, but I didn't know where he got the quote. I did not have an answer. So I learned pretty, pretty early on that during the debates in the, in the, uh, sort of the follow-up uh, time, you don't address every single point that they address. In fact, most of the times you just simply ignore the points that they make and make your own points because that's, yes, the, best way, you know, that's the best way to go about it. So I ignored it. But I made a note. And, and I went home and did a little bit of search, and sure enough, immediately found the quote. It turned out that the quote ended with a comma, and Gould <laughs> said something afterwards like, but nobody really believes that, blah, 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 right? No, no sane person would believe that. I said, no, you bastard. <laughs> so, it's, it's always in the editing, isn't it? Yeah. So I made a copy of the full quote, and I said, one of these days might be useful. Sure enough, months later, we debate again. He forgot about it, because he always presents exactly the same slides. He has, you know, he does something like he did at the time. I don't, I don't think he does anymore, but uh, something like 400 debates a year. So sometimes he debates twice in the same day. So it's like, okay, fine. Um, um, so he presents the same slide, and I said, "Oh, God just <laughs> delivered his in, unto me, my friend." <laughs> uh, so I waited for my rebuttal. And I presented the full the full quote, and he got really upset. And he said, well, I can't quote the whole book. I said, well, no, but you might want to quote after, you know, past the comma, especially if the latter part of the sentence is actually contradicting the first part. So at the end of the debate, it was interesting what happened. A bunch of people on his side came up to me, and they said, well, I still don't buy, you know, I don't believe your, your side of, sto- of the story, but I was really disappointed that Dr. Kish had to do that, because if he has truth on his side, you know, why does he have to lie to us? 
So that, was, that is another way of, you know, in which you score points. Now, the question is, what does Dwayne Gish actually believe? Does he know that he did something wrong there? And I think the answer there is, uh, I think it was Martin Luther that said that a, li that a lie is acceptable if it is in the service of, the, of God. Yeah. I mean, they, know, they, they do that. They, they actually use that kind of... Uh, it's, it's fine. If, you, if, you, if the stakes are you want to save people from going to hell, eh, you fudge the truth a little bit. And you know, it's it's a it's what philosophers call a conflict of values. Truth saving people from hell. This one trumps that one, and they know that, and then they act accordingly. But they act honestly accordingly, in a bizarre way. Now well, that, my friends, was the last question. I'm oh. sorry. Oh no. Oh. See, you guys should have gotten coffee earlier. <laughs> yeah, we had all this. We had all this free time early on, and we were just rambling on about, I don't know, mint juleps or something. Yeah. I know, but you know what? I found a lot of the things you guys had to say to be very interesting. Knowing your background and where you come because it really, you know, if somebody asked you the question, how did you get to your current state, you would not have answered it the same way that you That's answered true. it by just, uh, you're calling it rambling on. I, I know a lot more about both of you than I did when I came in. That's the point of these. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. Uh, <laughs> well, it is. So I hear that, that you know you'll be saying, yeah, well, you know, Nickel sort of uh, had one the mint julep too many and stumbled into skepticism. I heard him say that. <laughs> well, you know, they both dated, you know, and we both dated, Jimmy and we Scott. both, that's right. <laughs> right. We don't remember it, but apparently we. Yeah.